Hey everybody, this is Mike. What you're about to hear is part two of my interview with Gary Luck as we discuss Dreamland from the Endless Wire album. The last episode was the first half of that interview. This is the second half. Hope you enjoy it. The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? <laughs> So if you need me near you, you can do it if you choose. And I'm assuming that means, you know, you can take advantage of my offer to help you or to support you, but we're not talking about hooking up again. I think you're right. Um, I think that's a very, very good interpretation of that. The other interpretation that I had was can do it if you choose is that you've got a choice whether you use drugs or not. You've got a choice whether you pick up the next drink or not. I'll be here for you whether you do it or not. You can, you can do it if you choose. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. That was my interpretation of that. Yeah, or you can choose to go the other way. You can yeah. choose to walk away from this. And this is in the late 70s, so the whole idea of recovery and rehab was still kind of in its infancy. I mean, yeah. there was Alcoholics Anonymous and things like that, but we didn't know as much as we know now about substance abuse and how to recover from it. So. I think Gordon now, if he were asked about that song, he would probably say, it's not that simple. I mean, you can't just turn and walk away if you're that deeply into addiction. And if I'm not mistaken, she was into heroin and cocaine, and those are the worst of them. Cocaine, I'm told, is more difficult because you can kick heroin faster. But the point being that she certainly has to choose to get well, but as we know now, it's not just a case of I'm going to wake up and say I'm not going to be an addict anymore. Yeah, look, it's it must be re really, really difficult. You know, I, I, I did do a little bit of study on Wikipedia and I read the Jennings biography and understand that actually from about 1977 to 1982, she was really, really in the depths of despair with both heroin and cocaine. And in fact, I understand that the speedball that she mixed for John Belushi in March 1982 when he died from that overdose was a mix of heroin and cocaine that she had brought to the party. It only occurred to me this morning, thinking about this interview that we were going to have, is that in 1982 she probably hit a massive rock bottom. It was also the same year that Gordon got sober. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of that connection in the same year that she'd sort of hit rock bottom he decided he'd had enough and he was going to quit the whole thing and start living life as he really should. Yeah, living it cleanly. And I don't know a whole lot about his recovery story, but we can talk about that another time on the show. You make me do what you want me to do, then you run the rules on me. And I almost thought what he was saying is that you change the rules on me. I mean, you get me to do something because I'm ahead of her heels for you. And then you criticize me because I didn't do it enough or I did it too much or to use a football metaphor, you're going to move the goalposts, you know, yeah, so that yeah, I can't yeah. ever really make you completely happy. Yeah. Once again, I think it's, uh, it's a really, really good interpretation. We, I'm not particularly familiar with that phrase. We, we don't use it in Australia as far as I know. It, it might be a Canadian thing, Mike. I don't know. <laughs> to run the rules on somebody, I think you summed it up pretty well. I, I actually... <laughs> I knew this was coming up, so I had to look it up. This particular quote, one of the urban dictionary, dictionaries or something, was to examine, scrutinize, or inspect someone to see if they are worthy. Oh. See if they are worthy. And I would say that she was setting all these goals for him or, or all these things for him to do, and then she'd be really, really critical when he didn't meet her sort of standards or he didn't measure up. And that must have been a hell of a strain on the on the relationship. But, you know, as they say, rules are rules. She might have been saying to him something like, don't do as I do, do as I say. Yeah. And if she's not moving the goalposts for him, every time he jumps through some hoop, she has to reevaluate the relationship and make yeah. him feel even more like if I don't do what you want, then you're going to leave or you're going to make me feel terrible or this, that or the other. That must have been extraordinarily painful for somebody who was that much in love with her. 
And I, I don't know if she did. I don't know enough about Kathy Smith to say whether or not she did that maliciously or whether that was just her nature or whether it was the addict mindset. But it is what happened. And I think that he really got burned by that. He did. And, and also, it must have been terribly hard work trying to work your way through that relationship when those are the rules of the game. Yeah. If those are the rules of the relationship, then it's going to be really, really hard work. At yeah, that sorry. point, I think it ceases to be love, honestly. I mean, at that point, you're dedicated to an idea. But if it's going to be that much work, how much tenderness is really involved? How much grace is really involved? And yeah. without having heard him talk about it in the context of this song, we don't know. But it certainly sounds like, as you said earlier, Gary, he got to the point where he's saying, I'm bankrupt. I have nothing emotionally left to give and this is just going to be painful again if we continue to do this. So I have to walk away from it. I think you're right, Mike. I think that, as you said, the love part was probably over and the relationship had just simply become transactional. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Transactional. Yeah. You seem to be the wiser now. Could it be you've been deceived? Maybe she thinks that she's learned a lesson or she's better off now, or now I can face the world, or now I've overcome this, or now I'm a better person. And maybe he's looking at her and saying, no, you've still got the addictive mindset. You're still up to your old tricks. Yeah. Leopards don't change their spots, whatever cliche you want to use. Yeah. It's a really interesting uh, phrase that one could be deceived. Um, you seem to be wiser now. One other take that I had on it was that you seem to be wiser now. I'm not sure whether you really are or not. Have you come to terms with all these other things going on in your life? Have you come to the realization that the drugs aren't the answer? In fact, there's a deceit going on here. There's a substance that's deceiving you and leading you down a certain path. Let's hope that you can give it up. Let's hope that you wise up because I, I really believe up to this point in time you've been deceived. But it's really interesting that, as you said earlier, if that's the case, then Lightfoot, as we've said, was battling his own demons at the same time. And would he really be able to put that kind of a spin on it? I'm not sure. I think I like your interpretation better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I certainly did my best with it. And then he closes, and this wasn't in the printed lyrics, but if you listen to it, he says, anytime you felt like trying, you would cause my heart to break. There was too much toil in dreamland and too much love at stake. And that's where maybe he's clearing up just a little bit of the mystery here. There was too much to lose. And we would have completely destroyed each other if we had stayed together, or at least he's feeling like he would have been destroyed. It's not as enigmatic anymore. And he does that at the very end. And for all I know, he might have just thought of that in the studio and said, you know, let's keep it. Let's keep it. It, it, it works. It rhymes. It, it's a great way to end the song. Or he may have, as you say, come to the realization that he's trying to sum it up in this phrase that if they stuck together, they simply would have just destroyed one another. Where he uses that other phrase, uh, following on from, could you have been deceived? Any time you felt like trying, you would cause my heart to break. I thought that maybe he was saying to her, look, are you trying to give up or are you trying to shoot up? Any time you felt like trying, either to shoot up or to give up, it's got to be a disaster either way because I know you're not going to succeed. I'm going to be brokenhearted by the whole damn thing. So let's just wrap it up now and move on. Yeah. I mean, trying, we don't really know what she's trying, but we, don't. But we do know that the upshot of it is that he's going to get his heart broken. Yeah, exactly. And he didn't want that anymore. As you said, he'd been hurt enough that had they stayed together, sure, they would have destroyed each other completely. And he didn't want that. If he was in this other relationship with Kathy Kearney at the time, he just wanted to move on and try and clean up his own act, which, as you said earlier, is still four or five years away. Right. We'll be right back to our conversation with Gary Luck about Dreamland, but first a word from a podcast partner or two. Hello, my name is Sandro. And my name's Zach. We are historians. 
Well, movie historians, we're not qualified for anything else. Join us on our podcast, Oldie But A Goodie, where for all of 2022, we're reviewing movies from the year 2001. That's right. Every episode, we look at all the movies that came out that week back in 2001. Then we pick one film and we do a full synopsis review. It's it's Oldie But A Goodie. Sometimes, m- most of the time, we find bad movies. It's usually a fun time, but also usually one of us ends up pulling our hair out by the end of the episode. And we have a lot of hair between between us. What a selling point for the trailer. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was pretty exciting. Oldie but a goodie. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. A That's Not Kind of Productions podcast. Radio is so much different than it was in the 80s. We had it all. The music, the movies, the DJs and morning shows. Back to the 80s Radio is a show from the 80s in podcast form. We bring the memories from that awesome decade back. Join Toscano and Chang every Friday as they take you on a ride back in time, sharing their experiences and laughs. Stop on by and discover some of the wacky things this crazy duo comes up with. They talk about it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the greatest decade. Don't miss the greatest 80s podcast in the world. Back to the 80s radio. So then he does finish up the song, and the song does appear on Endless Wire, as we've said. It's the sixth track on the record, and I think it probably opened up side two. I've never looked at it on vinyl, but I think that's probably how it would be. It was the third single from that album, the first one being the title track, and I think the other might have been The Circle is Small. And it did okay. I mean, it did get to 24 on the Canadian Adult Contemporary Chart. It went to 100 in the U.S. Country Chart. The single didn't chart in Australia, but the album did. It went to number two in Canada and 22 in the U.S. and then 56 in Australia, which is not stupendous but still isn't bad considering that the reviews that endless wire got were nowhere as good as the the reviews for the previous three albums sure yeah it it didn't chart all that well in australia um i don't know why i mean there are so many songs on that album that i personally love you know dreamland obviously being one and daylight katie and children had wings i just love that ballad and what was the oh there's there's one other one there that that I like, but but I've got a bit of a quirky sense of humor. The Hang Dog Hotel a Room. Because I've heard a lot of good things about that one. It rattles along brilliantly and love to play that in the band. Well, yeah, I want to hear a recording of that doing by the band sometime. What's your favorite musical aspect of Dreamland? I like the chord structure. I mean, it's fairly simple. He follows the same chord structure all the way through, including not verses and choruses. But the chord structure, the intro and the outro, it just seems to bookend the song beautifully for me. The other thing that musically that I like is use of the G sus4 chord, where you can hammer on and off that second string halfway through each verse, which just, if you're just playing it on your own, it sort of adds a nice touch. Yeah, and we're getting into a little bit of guitar talk here, and it is a very simple chord progression. I think it's very well mixed. I mean, we can hear Gordon's acoustic guitar. Pee Wee's steel, to me, is the best part of the song, but it doesn't overwhelm the rest of the production. And I'm assuming that we don't know exactly who played on this track, but I'm going to assume that it was Terry Clements, Rick Haynes, and Barry Keane on drums. Um, I don't think Jim Gordon played on this record. The thing that I find interesting, and I couldn't believe this, was that he has only played this song twice in concert in the entire career. Once in October of 1978, which is he's still touring to promote the Endless Wire album. Then he played it once in 2014, and he has not done it since at all. Now, I find that really, really amazing because for him, I would imagine it's, um, I, I like the song. I think it's a great song, but I think for him and, and his band, but I imagine it's a fairly easy song for them to play. Let's just rock into Dreamland. We'll go through that fairly up tempo. They breeze through it fairly, fairly quickly. And I would have thought it would have made his playlist many, many times over. But to hear that he's only actually done it twice in concert just absolutely stays me. Yeah. Or at least as I mean, there may have been other times, but according to setlist.fm, which is a reasonably accurate uh, count, you know, he hasn't done it more than that. I would love to hear him do that in concert, but I don't know if I'd want him to open a concert with it. I think to me, it's almost too gentle 
to open up. And I'd love to hear him open up within my fashion or something like that. But yeah, I, great idea. We'll never know this probably, but I'm wondering if that song hit too close to home for him or when he saw that it didn't do well in the US and Canada, didn't do well in Australia at all. He finally just said, that, you know, let's not bother with it anymore. Or did it hit too close to home because it was talking about his relationship with Kathy Smith? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it might have just hit too close to home. I think that probably following her arrest in 1982 or 83 or whatever it was, and then she came up with that book a couple of years later, Chasing the Dragon, that he thought, I've done with it. I've said my goodbyes as well as I can in song, as nicely as I can, as you said earlier. It certainly wasn't a bitter song that he just wanted simply to put that to bed. Maybe also that he felt that by that stage, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the chronology here, that Pee Wee Charles had left the band, so he didn't have pedal steel going on. And maybe he thought, I really need pedal steel in this song if I'm going to do it. Because as we know, Gordon is such a stickler for detail. Yeah. Um, that, that maybe he felt, oh, I suppose Mike Heffernan might have joined by then. I guess he could have done something on keyboards, I guess. But I think he was probably either come to the conclusion that he said goodbye to Kathy as well as he could. He didn't want to continue on saying goodbye to her any longer through that song and or he was missing Pee Wee on pedal steel. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, Pee Wee left and Gordon said when Pee Wee left, he said, I won't replace you. And there, right. there hasn't been a pedal steel player in Lightfoot's entourage, I think, since then. Maybe right. in the studio, but not certainly not in performing. There are no official covers of this song either. And when I say official, I mean on a record or a CD or, you know, that contracted artist has done. Obviously, yeah, sure. people do. And I'm sure your band has done it. Is there someone from modern music that you would like to hear do it, Gary? Uh, yes. Well, firstly, my, no, my band hasn't done it. I'm still trying to oh, negotiate okay. it with the guys. We're, we're a very, very democratic band. We all have to agree on a song. And if one person has got some particular problems, whatever, whatever reason, then we don't do it. As far as other artists are concerned, if I could choose an Australian artist, which is, I think, also a trio, I'd go with the Waifs. I don't know whether you've heard of the Waifs or not. I know they've toured the US many, many times. They've actually toured with Bob Dylan. I would love to hear them do it. I think they'd do a great job. All right. Well, you're closer to them than I am, so maybe you can pass the word along. Um, <laughs> so, geographically, I'm it. <laughs> We'll be right back to our conversation with Gary Luck about Dreamland, but first a word from a podcast partner or two. Have you ever taken a great high school history class? If you have, then you'd probably agree that the one thing that made it so enjoyable was your teacher, and understandably so. At their best, history teachers are vibrant storytellers, leading you on a gripping, fun, fantastic learning journey. But sadly, we know it can be pretty difficult to continue that journey after graduation, with no one there to be your entertaining tour guide through the world of dense, obscure historical research. Fortunately, 20 Minute History is here to help with that. It's the new podcast that aims to be your very own high school history teacher for everything you didn't learn in high school. Come join us as we explore commonly unknown histories in our informative, engaging, and amusing 20-minute episodes. It's 20-Minute History, out now on all your podcasting platforms. As kids, we were a blank sheet of paper with no life experience. And now we are paper balls full of perfect imperfections. Join me on the Grown Up Podcast as I explore these imperfections with you and occasional guests to give a different perspective on life that will make you think just a little deeper. Along the way, we celebrate independence by catching the waves of independent musicians with the now segment better known as Naturally on a Wave. If you're ready to smooth your imperfections so you can show up for yourself, then search Grown Up, look for the perfectly and perfect paper ball and press play tune into the grown-up podcast on apple Podcasts, spotify pandora iheart radio and more oh yeah remember to subscribe so you'll never miss an episode Well, let's talk about you a little bit. I mean, you do have a band and uh, you do a good amount of Lightfoot, if not exclusively Lightfoot. But tell us how that got started and tell us what you're doing now, what you've been doing, what your plans are going to be for the band. Oh, well, thank you for offering 
I don't really like talking about myself all that much, Mike, but seeing, seeing you open the door, um, getting back to that story I told earlier, when I realised that Gord was never going to tour Australia again, Penny finally dropped a thought, well, maybe I could put together some kind of tribute show. I don't, don't really like calling it a tribute show, but do something in honour of Gordon Lightfoot and his life, his music. And it's taken a long, long time for it to come together. Then one day we were playing out at a place called um, Braidwood, which isn't far from Canberra, about an hour away. And who should be sitting in the uh, concert but Keith Podka, who is a famous member of the Seekers, um, famous Australian group, had a lot of big hits. Yeah, um, I'll Never Find Another You and yeah, Georgie Girl. Georgie Girl. Yeah, and matter of fact, their uh, lead singer just passed away a few couple of months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, just Durham. Durham, she, thank you. Yeah. yeah. She just a few weeks ago. In fact, it's been a very, very sad time for uh, Keith and the other boys in the band, Bruce uh, Woodley and Athel Guy, and Keith is still dealing with it. And uh, he's still going through the grieving process. He's healing and dealing. And Fred and I, the other member of our band, Fred's our bass player, and he's also fabulous on fostering guitar, have said, look, Keith, just take as much time as you need. Because the Seekers would have actually been coming up to celebrate the 60th anniversary of being together in December. And Keith is often referred to Judith Durham. They were very, very, very close as his little sister. So he's been devastated by her uh, passing and it's obviously just needed time out, you know, to deal with that. But anyway, that day, going back a few years earlier, he was sitting in the audience at Braidwood and at half time, he said something like, oh, look, Gary, I kind of like what you guys are doing on stage. Maybe I can help out. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? He said, yeah, he said, just hang on a minute, I'll race across the road, I'll grab my 12-string guitar, and let's start the second set with Sundown. Oh, and my gosh. I, I said, oh, well, Keith, well, we've never played it together before, and uh, do you know the song? And he said, well, I know the first verse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good start. <laughs> it's a good start. So he said, look, so at intermission, he gra goes across the road, he grabs his famous 12-string guitar, which he was famous for on I'll Never Find Another You or the Carl. Sure, right? yeah. All those other hits. Uh, I said, so how are we going to start this, Keith? He said, well, look, like I said, I'm just going to do the first verse. He said, then you take over. I'll go into harmony mode with Fred. I said, yeah, but how are we going to start the song? He said, don't worry about it, Gary. Just follow me. Uh, and with that, he launches into this magnificent opening riff for Sundown, which I'd never heard before. That's pretty impressive. He's actually making me sound good and look good. So off we went. And then we had a lot of fun doing that. The show finished. And about six months later, I got a phone call from him saying, look, Gary, that was a lot of fun. Maybe we should get together and discuss this more seriously. So to try and cut a long story short, Mike, for about the last six years, certainly four, because we lost two years because of COVID like everybody else has. Sure. We've been working up this act, which is where we call ourselves the Light Feet Band. We couldn't call ourselves Light Feet because apparently some podiatrist in Melbourne owns that word. Oh, okay. So, so we couldn't use simply Light Feet. But we've tried to do a show which is in honour of Gordon, his life, his music, all the songs that he sang, because you can only do about 23 in a two-hour show, and we've tried to reimagine them and do them our way. So we're not, a, we're not impersonating or trying to imitate. We don't dress or sound terribly like Lightfoot. You know, we do our best, and Keith is such an amazing arranger of music, so that he did all the arrangements for the Seekers, both vocal and instrumental, so he does them for us as well. And so we've reimagined Lightfoot's music in our own Aussie way, and uh, we've been getting a lot of great feedback as we go around. Well, that's awesome. And when we finish producing this, I'll ask for you to send me a link to either one of the songs of the band's website so I can put it in the show notes. Now, you're also a composer and a playwright. You've done a bit of that, and you did show me some of that online before we went on the air. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you. Thank you again for asking. Well, firstly, well, just getting back to your other point, I would love to send you three or four copies of our CD that Keith did produce, Keith and Fred produce, which is called Light Feet Sing Light Foot. There's only seven tracks on it. But getting back to the other issue that you mentioned, I've been on the board of directors of the Australian Songwriters Association now for some 15 years. I have been trying to write my own songs on and off since about the age of 14. Probably written only about 60 songs, which are all registered with APRA, which is our Performing Rights Association. 
And to tell you quite honestly, and you might think this is funny as well, it's probably only about 15 of them that I would ever let see the light of day. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm a songwriter myself, and I can tell okay. you there's a lot of junk that I've written, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of stuff that I'm proud of too. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. Exactly right. Same here. And I'm getting around to the stage where I've said to both Fred and Keith, can you please help me out here? I've got to get this album recorded. So I've got 12 out of the 15 that I would ever let see the light of day. And we're in the middle of going through the recording process now. I'm going to call it Imaginary Postcards where each song in a sense is a postcard it tells a story that is aimed at a certain topic the other question you asked was the playwright issue about three years ago i got involved in a festival here in canberra called the short and sweet festival mm -hmm. and i figured they needed people to write plays that are only 10 minutes long so i thought well why don't i write a musical drama based on two songs that were really really critical in lightfoot's life that sort of almost defined his life in in terms of his relationships with the people we've been talking about, not to mention his first wife as well, if you could read my mind, and Sundown. Then I hit on the song that we've been talking about, Dreamland. And I thought, why don't I write a play called Dreamland based on how he came to write, if you could read my mind, and Sundown. So I wrote this 10-minute play, would you believe, because that's all we were allowed. Sure. And I tried to introduce, there are six scenes, would you believe, in the play, and I tried to introduce each scene with a 30 or 40 second burst from six songs of Lightfoot. So I'd sit on stage, I'd go into 30 or 40 seconds, and then the actors would go into their act, act out the part. And so the six songs that I chose very, very quickly, I think if I can get these in order, were Daylight Katie, Sundown, If You Could Read My Mind, Second Cup of Coffee, That's What You Get For Love And Me, and Dreamland, I finished on Dreamland. That's how I came to write that play. But it has occurred to me since, and since you asked, that what I would really, really love to do is expand that out to a full two-hour production, either a play or a biopic. Well, there you go. I mean, it sounds like that's your next big project. And if you need somebody to adapt that, you know where to find me in Mountain View, California. You're going to become my best buddy. I can tell that, Mike. I think the feeling is very mutual, Gary. So thanks. So where could people find the band or find your work online? Well, yes, we are on an, an indefinite break, probably till sometime next year while Keith deals with, you know, the Parsi of Judith and the Seekers do their thing in December as well. But at the moment, we have a web page called www.lightfeetband.com.au. Hmm. And if anybody who's listening wants to write and know more about that or would like a copy of the CD then the best person to write to is our manager, Elizabeth Hawkes. It's simply called lightfeet38 at gmail.com. Or if they simply want to talk to me firstly and have a chat about anything or everything, I'm on backtrack at web1.com.au or they can find me on Facebook. And I'm happy if people want to just hit me up on Facebook and say hi, become a friend. And you can't have too many friends, right? No, you can't. And especially these days when life we've learned in the past couple of years is so fragile yeah. because of COVID. I mean, we need all the good people in our circles we can get. So Gary, I wanted to thank you for taking the time 5,000 miles away and talking about our favorite artist. And I can't tell you what a pleasure it's been to talk to you today. Mike, it's been an amazing pleasure for me and indeed a great honor. And I, I'm just so pleased you asked me along to the show and find your way electronically all the way down here to the Antipodes. And one of these days, I'll make it down there with myself, with my wife and my son, and we'll be sure to look you up because we're headed to Canberra. Well, you better make sure you do. Come and stay with us and we'll have a great time jamming. I'm sure we will. Absolutely. Well, our next episode is going to be featuring my friend and old roommate, Dave Stewart, and he will be discussing Gordon's song, Ghost of Cape Horn, from the Dream Street Rose album that will be coming up in the last week of October. Until then, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. 
I love this show so much and I want to keep it going. And you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. 